Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, Catherine, um, thanks to you and Cree MSD for having us today. Um, you know, Tyson and I have been talking about this topic passionately, I would say, for a few years now, and it's a great opportunity to kind of condense our thoughts on this and try to put them into a practical format that people can um, can benefit from. Um, and so we've we've tried to do that. So hopefully you get some value out of out of this today. For those of you who are joining us, thank you to you for to all the viewers that are joining us today. I want to start with a uh, I want to start with imagining uh, a scenario. So imagine you're a personal support worker on your first day on the job. So you're you're in that first day when uh, there's a whole bunch of different orientation activities that you have to take part in. Um, one of those activities will likely be a session on uh, injury prevention while you're working. Um, often these sessions, so imagine the session is is uh, with in, in this sort of a setting, in a classroom sort of setting, where um, where there's someone that goes up to the front and uh, they have some uh, PowerPoint slides that they go through that talk about how injuries, different types of injuries happen and how they can be prevented. The question for you to start with here, how um, how do you think or, or do you think this type of training would be effective at reducing the risk of injury? Now, I think that we were that we're having some technical difficulties, so there there isn't isn't going to be a poll that pops up, but I'm going to ask you to just put your answer in the um, in the chat box. If you want, you can you can say yes or no or pick A or B and just put your answers in and I'll keep I'll keep going. I'm seeing some no's here. Good. Okay, so then the second question, thanks for putting in your answers. Okay, good. So the second question I was going to ask is, how well do you think the training offered by your organization is at, pre at preventing risk of injury? Uh, or, or do you think it's, it's, it's effective at reducing the risk of injury for the workers in your organization? Yes, no, or maybe. Go ahead and put those in. Maybe, I see some maybes, no, okay. Okay, thank you. Partially, yeah, okay, thank you for your answers. Um, okay, and then just a couple, uh, one more question just to get a sense of what area um, your what field you're from? So if you could enter in, uh, what if if you're from one of these three areas, firefighting, paramedic, healthcare, or other, if you want to say A, B, or C, or D is fine. And yeah, I guess if you're other, you can type in what what you mean by that. That's that's great. Safety Association, excellent. Mental health care. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. It's it's good to see that we have a, a nice a nice spread of um, of different backgrounds joining us today, and um, and and that's very helpful. Um, oh, sorry. And the last question I did have here: What role best describes you? So, are you a health and safety professional? Are you a worker, a researcher, again, other? And if you're other, you can go ahead and type in whatever um, what, whatever that role is. Ergonomist, researcher, health and safety professional, other manager. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. WSIB officer for union. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much for your answers. Okay, that that's actually really helpful to give us a sense of who who the audience is. Thank you. So, I'm going to start this off, um, and and the, my goal here is to really summarize some some excellent work that's been done by a group called the IRSST. They're a research group uh, out of Quebec. They actually did a French language version of this webinar a couple of uh, I guess a week ago, and that it will be available for viewing in French. Um, but my goal here is to start off by giving a quick summary of their main findings, the work that they've been doing for a number of years now, looking at training and manual handling tasks and and really i think they've done um they've done a better job than anyone else in the field right now and then tyson's going to take over and build on those findings by making some practical recommendations for how um how we can implement training programs in different fields um 
When we're talking about injury prevention in the workplace and training, I think it's important to note that training is only half of the story. And really, uh, you know, one other way of, talk, of describing training is to say that we're fitting the worker to the work. The flip side of that is the other half of this story, which is fitting the work to the worker. So we can't really talk about training without mentioning that, that we also need to look at this other side. And in fact, I would think most people in the field in, in this area would agree that that's probably the more important piece of this when we're trying to prevent injuries in the workplace. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And, and the example that I'll use for the for that is uh, from the field I'm familiar with in healthcare is the introduction of mechanical lifting to mechanical lift devices um, in hospitals and nursing homes, which has uh, you know become widespread over the past 20 or 30 years and has really reduced the loads that healthcare workers have to support while they're um, working with patients, they no longer have to manually lift patients very often. There are obviously some scenarios where, um, where these types of lifts aren't available. For instance, in home care, personal support workers are still required to do a lot of manual lifting, manual handling of patients, and there are many other jobs where this sort of thing is still required. And so, you know, the really our position here, what we're trying to, to share with you today is, you know, we want to try to fit the work to the worker first, then move on trying to find ways that we can train people, train workers to fit the work. Um, and this type of training is important for injury prevention, particularly in occupations where this type of manual lifting have heavy loads is unavoidable. And so this webinar today really is meant to set the stage for a series of webinars that will happen over the next few weeks on, um, on first responders, on, on how we can design training programs for first responders and in healthcare um, that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, to seeing more detailed analyses in, in those particular fields. The, you know, if you're anything like me, however, um, this particular statement, you know, before I got into this field and dug into the research a bit, this particular statement that I bolded here um, isn't particularly controversial. It doesn't, it, it seems kind of obvious that this might be something you want to do. But it turns out that actually this is a controversial thing right now because over from, from 2007 to about 2014, there were five reviews of, the, of all the research done in this area and they all concluded that training doesn't work. And so this is where the IRSST came into the picture and they looked at this and I think as many of us did, those of us that have looked at this literature said, wait a second, this doesn't quite sound right. And, um, and so they did a closer look at all the papers, the 77 papers that were covered within these five, review paper, uh, five reviews um, and, and dug into them to try to figure out what was going on. And this work is led by Denis Dennis and his team, um, and they did a, a fantastic job. Uh, links, by the way, to all of their reports. Uh, Tyson's going to provide a list at the end uh, for, for us for that. I think the most interesting finding that this team, Denis, uh, Dennis et al., that, that, that they found was that these five reviews didn't actually look at the quality of the training programs themselves. Instead, they actually focused more on the quality of the evaluation. And that, and, and the problem is, the main problem here is that good quality training programs were hard to evaluate, whereas poor quality evaluations are easier to evaluate. So if we go back, for instance, for training program that, that to the program that I mentioned someone might be part of that most people I think agreed would not be very effective at changing, uh, at, at reducing rates of injury, you, you can see that it might be easy to evaluate how well this program would work because you've got everyone together in a room at the same time, you can very carefully control what PowerPoint slides gets uh, get shared with them, um, and so you can quickly um, and effectively study the impact of this training program by, by uh, presenting it to a particular group and comparing to a group per perhaps that didn't get that training program. And so it's a very clean, a, a clean study to study, to, to evaluate. Um, compare that to a more complex problem that, you know, you might think based on the evidence that is a, a better quality training program 
and, and consider why it might be harder to evaluate this program. So, you know, imagine if you tried to incorporate for personal support workers, incorporate 15 minutes paid time every day when a series, when, when they're asked to do a series of core strengthening exercises. Imagine if you have a monthly session involved where you have a coach that meets with small groups of personal support workers in a special room they have where um, they can mock up different scenarios and they have a tub and a toilet and a sink and a bath bench and things and you can set these up in different configurations and have people work through different strategies for for performing different tasks that type of a program um, you know you probably wouldn't have uh, all the personal support workers involved in the exercise, you probably would have a number of different coaches who might deliver those coaching sessions differently. So it becomes a much messier program to evaluate. And so this is something that the IRSST folks, the, the team, found was a systematic problem with the way these training programs are evaluated. The high quality training programs tended to have poor quality evaluations, whereas the poor quality training programs had high quality evaluations. The consequence of that was that the conclusions of these five reviews were based on only about 10 percent of the paper of the 77 papers that that were out there. Um, but they only included those that were considered high quality evaluations, and this left out many high quality training programs. And so really the conclusion, I think the takeaway from this stuff is what, what all of these reviews should have concluded is that really bad training doesn't work. Not that training doesn't work, but that the training, the type of training that they've been able to evaluate what, with good quote unquote good quality evaluations doesn't work. So, um, how do we make better training programs? So the IRSST reports have given some really good guidance on these features as well after having dug through all the all the literature. Um, and, and one of the main findings is that these training programs should focus on helping workers apply ergonomic principles to their changing work environment rather than focusing on any particular techniques. So again, imagine you know the setting that we're talking that I've been talking about the personal support worker going into someone's home or going into a series of client homes. That worker is going to face a series of different environmental challenges. Every bathroom is probably different. Um, every patient is probably very different. The way you help one patient get in and out of a bathtub might be very different in someone else's home, which is set up differently with with a person that has different needs, and so the there is no one strategy that is likely to work in these cases getting someone on and off of a toilet is very different than getting someone in and out of a bathtub it's very different than getting someone in and out of a bed for instance there is no cookie cutter solution that this cookie cutter technique that you can necessarily say will work under all these scenarios and so we need to help people we need to help workers um, develop the skill of actually applying the core principles rather than focusing on techniques. And then we need to give them a chance to practice. So it's it's like any sport, you need the opportunity to practice these, these principles over and over to get better at doing them. Um, and it, it would be best if the way you did that practice was somehow in a real world scenario or at least reflected a real world scenario clearly. Um, and then we want to help teach uh, teach workers how to reduce or eliminate any hazards that are if if it's possible and and that can include things like getting help from someone when there's someone else available uh, rearranging work organizing your work removing physical obstacles making things um, that you know again going back to these basic principles that you're trying to achieve if you have a principle and you know that there's that you're trying to avoid flexing your spine if that is the principle you're if that's the goal is trying to avoid that um, finding ways to reorganize the space that you're working in so that you can do that effectively so that's um i think that's really the the in a nutshell the summary of the irst's work and i'll pass it over to tyson so that he can give us some practical um practical recommendations on how to implement these ideas in a training program
Okay, thanks, uh, Tilak. Um, so the question now becomes, how do we uh, how do we build high quality training? So we have some of the ingredients that uh, Tilak has already mentioned here, but how do we go about putting this together? So what we've done is that we kind of broaden our perspective and get us to kind of zoom out, um, you know, to take a really uh, multi and, and transdisciplinary approach. So really blending knowledge translation with kinesiology research and evidence. And the way we'll go about this, at least for today's talk, is to uh, introduce this uh, four phase process model. So just really simple to allow us to be able to um, to be able to kind of talk about the key points putting this together. So four phases. Um, it's collaborative. So those of you with, you know, an ergonomics background, you hear things like participatory or kind of, you know, community based type of work. So we're trying to keep people involved, uh, building in opportunities to iterate so that we can tailor and we can improve um, and progress. I think that's uh, important to highlight as well. So I'm going to walk us through now. One thing when I'm going through this, um, each one of these phases, you know, we could spend a whole day on. But I'm just going to kind of hit some high level pieces and you'll see pieces of this as we go through the remainder of the webinars of the month. Um, it's also important that we shouldn't be thinking about these phases uh, necessarily in isolation. You can see bi-directional arrows everywhere. The point is there is we you know, should be looking up and downstream as we're kind of putting things in, into, into practice. So from the assessment side, so what are we talking about here? Well, in a nutshell, we're just trying to really understand, you know, what's available, what the needs and wants, the preferences, all of those types of things, trying to get buy-in, getting people on the same page. Um, we want a shared understanding of what, you know, success looks like um, in what type of uh, time frame and how we're going to measure that. So really kind of beginning with the end in mind here getting all hands on deck. Now this sounds obvious and this is a you know a hugely challenging problem for a, a lot of people I'm assuming because I can imagine situations where you know where you're in a scenario where uh, you know this becomes a checkbox exercise, right? We're going to devote a half a morning and a couple of PowerPoint slides to train people how to uh, you know protect themselves. And I think you know, most of us you know would realize that that's not the optimal condition, especially when I'm going to give you some other things to think about kind of downstream here. So a lot of this you know maybe some change management techniques or. If you pushed me and said, that's all you're going to give me, I'm going to tailor it, um, you know, to really meet the needs and wants of the people involved. Uh, I've got some resources listed at the end to help guide that process. Um, but this is one of the most important parts when it comes to tailoring is just, you know, see what you can do, um, explore and try to reach a, a common ground with all the stakeholders involved. So with that said, um, if we think about the groups that we're kind of focusing on in this series of webinars, uh, there are certainly, you know, a lot of differences, the environments, the tasks, the workers themselves, the kind of general characteristics. So, you know, this is why tailoring and it still shows up in the literature quite a bit about why tailoring is so important because the workers themselves need to see relevance. So, you know, playing around with boxes in a boardroom is not going to go super far with a lot of these types of workers. Um, it's not representative of what their work looks like, at least not for them. People who are experienced, we're able to kind of map this to different, you know, once you're, you're, you've learned, you can transfer this to more complex tasks because you understand the principles. Um, but that's not going to be the case for most people, especially with the type of training that we're talking about. So design is, you know, we're putting this, you know, putting the pieces together based on what our assessment told us is possible, you know, and what we're trying to accomplish. So despite the fact that we're tailor tailoring, uh, uh, we want to also appreciate that there are principles, right? So it's not that you know, every single training program won't have any basis or any commonalities. And that's kind of the things that we will focus on here in, in the upcoming slides. So there certainly are um, some principles. Uh, I'm not going to cover a lot of the details on the principles. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of they're a little bit nuanced to try to get through, but I think, you know, I think we could have a good discussion about that if uh, there's a need for that. So this may be more of a uh, controversial for some people, depending on the scenario that you're in. But if I look at, we look at the, lit the literature more broadly, um, the way I would kind of pitch this is probably more aligned with, you know, performance or athletic model where you have a kind of general and specific component. So in a perfect world, if you asked me, you know, what should be in, 
a, a manual handling training program for these type of workers who have physically demanding and oftentimes non-modifiable work. Um, the general component, what this is really kind of reflecting is acknowledging that musculoskeletal health has a lot of underpinning you know, factors that will influence it. The work that we do, uh, the work that is done by these workers is certainly you know, a potential factor, um, but there are a whole bunch of other factors. So, you know, in a general sense, depending on their health and wellness, you know, programs or even in a training seminar, I would try to promote and perhaps provide support for other health enhancing behaviors, because effectively, you know, in one in one sense, these are kind of the raw ingredients or the, you know, the raw materials you need to really take the most from specific training. Now, I have physical exercise highlighted here. So there are numerous factors in the literature linked with musculoskeletal health. But uh, when it comes to manual handling, there's actually um, direct evidence that physical exercise and especially resistance training sufficient enough to uh, achieve strength gains um, is protective, uh, both from prevention and even a management standpoint for so symptom modification or management. So there's direct evidence on this. Now, the specific component, um, this is probably where things will get a lot different. I don't think anything was entirely controversial for the general piece, but I could imagine some of you saying, you know, how would I do this? You know, changing health behaviors are difficult and that's uh, definitely a, a real world problem. But the specific component, you know, one thing I think that the, the papers, the reports that TLOC was talking about, a couple of really great points are that, or things that I think fit well with more fundamental kinesiology theory. We don't want to be thinking about teaching people techniques. Work is too variable, and a specific technique doesn't work for everybody um, all the time, and it, different people or in across situations, okay? It depends. There are many factors at play. So if you're handling a patient, you need to also be considering, you know, the patient's health and safety in addition to your own. If it's, you know, an inanimate object, that becomes less of an issue. But maybe, you know, with a previous ankle injury or their personal protective equipment you're wearing, you know, that the specific techniques are going to vary between people and over time. So um, what you what we want to be thinking about in specific is really teaching people to self-monitor and self-regulate their work. Okay, so situational and body awareness are kind of these fundamental underlying principles. And what that means is, you know, teaching and training people to really kind of read their work situation. So not just the tasks, but also the environments, you know, these systems. So do they need to be handling as frequently? Are there ways to organize things when that comes up so that they're not handling more than they need to be? Um, when handling is completely, you know, um, unavoidable. And I think TLOC hit the point before is that the best way is to eliminate the hazard. And if you can avoid handling, do that. And I think that there are opportunities, even in the groups that I've worked with, where you can do that. And I think that's not something that we do a good job training. Um, and then the other piece of this, so, you know, we've used the, the jargon of fitting work to worker and fitting uh, worker to the work. Uh, the one thing I see in the literature, I think, is a bit, it's a bit of a false dichotomy, because if you're, you know, using ergonomic principles to adapt your work, we also want to think about how that couples to your actual movements themselves. So, you know, we think of the work and the and the worker as a as a complex system. So, you know, the, the worker affects the work, the work feeds back and affects the worker. And we've seen evidence in the literature that sometimes we make really good ergonomic changes, but then workers will adapt their movements and basically negate any of those changes because, you know, they don't assume risk or, or whatever it is, or they think it's safe now. So uh, my position or our position is that training should always be part of it, um, even when you do when you have an opportunity to do good ergonomics. And ultimately, of course, the idea here is to then control the hazards and reduce risks um, wherever you can. So that's, you know, if we think of the design on the previous slide, those are the components, okay? So the things that we're trying to kind of put together. Where the rubber hits the road, I, I believe, is in the implementation. So how do you make this stuff happen, in, you know, given context? And that's where a lot of, you know, your contextual analysis and your assessment is going to dictate what's possible. I work with firefighters a lot, so exercise is not a super hard sell. You know, they have provision to train on shift. They've got uh, facilities to do that. So we really use that as a lever. 
Um, whereas I can, I definitely know the other occupations and groups that we're talking about don't have um, those same supports and opportunities. So, um, we, you know, again, we can chat about those with some questions that come up. But the idea here is that when we're implementing, and until I kind of uh, hit at this already or hinted at this, but remember that we're trying to actually change movement behavior here. Okay, these are motor skills, which means that pamphlets and pictures can only go so far. Um, it would be interesting, you know, that if we started training athletes like this who had complex physical needs and demands and then giving them pamphlets and assuming that they could enact those in the real world. On its face, you would laugh me, you know, off the stage, uh, metaphorically speaking, if I said that. But a lot of manual handling training, that's what it looks like. And it doesn't really align with what we, you know, quote unquote, know from kinesiology other things. So let's talk a little bit about the general components. So um, referring back to a slide a few minutes ago, any exercise, any resistance training that produces strength gains has shown some positive effects for manual handlers. So we could kind of stop it there. And I think there's a lot of, that leaves a lot of options for people. Uh, some of the work that we've done, we tried to, because we have this option, especially with firefighters, we've taken a slightly more sophisticated approach um, where we use exercise or we reimagine exercise as an opportunity to practice. Okay, so we're building physical literacy and movement competency. We're building physical capacities and fitness. And we can do this in a training environment by the way that we select exercises and the way that we coach them. So a lot of it's communicating, a lot of it's really helping people generalize. You're trying to basically teach habits here. And our work uh, so far that we've done has been fairly promising. You know, we haven't subjected this to a clinic or a trial to see if it actually changes injury rates. But what we have shown on the right, you know, just a really simple example, but we had firefighters go through this type of training and an intervention study. And we had them performing a whole bunch of um, job specific tasks that we didn't practice. Okay, so we did the stuff in the gym trying to teach movement principles about leverages and how you position your body, but it's very experiential, right? People get a really good handle on what their body is capable of and how to situate their body for their, you know, given capacities. And then when you find the weak links in the training, then we um, improve those, we address those through training. So this is part of the literacy piece. You're teaching people to read and understand you know, physical tasks and how their body interfaces. And that's really part of, you know, the reading the environment type thing. You can do this, you know, in a very abstract environment like exercise. So uh, just one example, what we were able to show with this, um, and it did surprise me a bit, it was our hypothesis, but it definitely um, was stronger than I thought it was going to be. But in really quickly here, we were able to show positive training transfer. Sorry able to show positive training transfer. So we had three groups. We had this kind of movement, you know, what I'm talking about over here, this more sophisticated exercise style. We contrasted that to a very similar program, but coached a lot differently and, you know, really kind of more of a conventional way to train. Um, and then, of course, a control group. Um, we've operationalized this. So a positive, uh, you know, improvement is what we're or a positive change is what we want to see here a positive number and we can see across the board in that simple lifting task that had low loads high velocities high loads high velocities so multiple different just simple lifts we were able to use that and, and actually elicit positive training transfer without actually practicing any job related tasks and we should show this across many um, tasks. This is just the easiest one in the time that we have to show you. So short story, even exercise without the opportunity to do very specific technique training um, can also uh, to, to transfer that way. I should mention too, there are many, many other ways that exercise transfers, right? We build tissue strength and quality and quantity. Um, you know, we have all these other psychosocial and behavioral kind of outcomes that come with exercise, the competence, the confidence, uh, you know, the valuing of, of buying in. If you coach this well, you can achieve those types of things. <clears throat> and that's really kind of fundamental kinesiology, uh, you know, type of paradigms for exercise versus maybe just a physiological type of approach. So when it comes, that's the, the general side. So we can, you know, elicit positive transfer, even just with doing exercise without practicing tasks. Uh, some of the more recent work that we've done, we've kind of slowed up writing this, uh, mostly due to the con current conditions. This is some CREA-MSD funded work, and so is the exercise stuff that I talked about. So greatly, greatly appreciated. 
Um, talking about specific components now, so if we're looking at you know manual handling tasks, some of the work that we've kind of just wrapped up here is looking at you know this kind of standard way that a lot of training is done. So taking lifting guidelines, we did this one in particular, taking paramedic lifting guidelines and manual handling guidelines. Where the idea here is, you know, we give people the principles and we teach them, we educate them. You know, we transfer the knowledge from the trainer to the trainee. So it's very trainer centric, um, as opposed to you know nothing super experiential. Even if you practice, it's still very much about you know transmitting knowledge to people. And again, if we think back to the fact we're trying to change motor skills and motor behavior, that on its face should be questioned as a, as an effective way to do training. So we compared in this study um, that kind of standard approach to a more training and coaching base. So where it's really focusing on competencies and skills and not just knowledge. And this is experiential. So we did this with very low tech because we wanted to be able to do this in the real world eventually. Um, but this is the laboratory study of motor learning and kind of kinesiology type study using simple um, tactile feedback individualized coaching and instruction. And what we're doing here is not teaching people a technique. We're saying you can move your body around and position yourself whatever way that you want to, but we just want to prevent you, know, you from using all of your spine motion. We don't want you really at end range with these heavy loads. So what this looked like was we had them come in and we had a, a one day training session first. Okay, so they came in, they did this simple lift here, this box lift. And this dotted line here, 70%, was kind of our bio, biomechanical or biological threshold, above which when people bend that far, you know, 70% of their max, they really start to load up the discs and the ligaments. So our job or what we were thinking was, can we, you know, reduce and increase the margin of safety when people are lifting these tasks. So then we had the intervention here, and what we saw was an immediate skill acquisition. Um, both, and again, this is a fairly simple task, but both of these um, approaches, both the kind of teaching or didactic, you know, technically versus an experiential type or motor learning. But you can see there's definitely, you know, a difference here in the magnitude of response. So whether or not that's clinically or biomechanically or practically significant, we don't know, but it's quite evident here. And then we had them come in a week later and we saw that there was kind of, you know, an increase again in the amount of flexion that they showed. Um, and this is really a, an assessment of trans or, uh, retention. So they learned the skill, did they retain it over a one week period? And you can see that both of them, you know, we've lost a little bit of that initial training effect, but uh, you know, definitely the second one stayed, you know, with a little more margin of safety between that, uh, you know, that level that or that threshold that we've set. Now, this is a very simple box lift. This was practiced, especially by the, you know, the uh, motor learning group or the more training and coaching group. But we also had them perform tasks that we didn't practice. So just some basic, um, you know, equipment handling, medical bag handling type thing. We see a similar pattern again here. So just again, we want, we're looking at that 70% threshold. You know, we saw this, um, this is now an assessment of transfer. So this is now, you know, doing something that I haven't done before. And we can see this again, we see, you know, a difference between these two and a little bit of, you know, kind of loss of that, but not very much actually, and still did a really good job after the fact. Just to really kind of highlight this though, this is a task where there's a lot of flexibility um, in how people do it, right? It's a really wide open tasks. So they could, you know, position their body any way they could, you know, without kind of using all of their spine motion. And then finally, we compared this with a more complicated task, which is a lot less, we didn't expect to see a huge training effect, but here, if I kind of alert you to the axis, we're already starting, you know, at 70 on the axis here. So we're taking people from almost their maximum flexion. So if you know, we had them stand up and try to bend over as far as they can and touch their toes, they're approaching almost that same point to try to grab this backboard, this team backboard lift from the ground. Now we did see, you know, an effect here. I'm saying transferred, yes, but we're still not approaching our threshold. So yeah, we can bump at this statistically, but practically this is questionable. Uh, we do see again coming in a week later, um, you know, we're almost back to baseline in this particular case. This is a really good example of, you know, training can only go so far, 
But I think there are, you know, at least technique type training, you know, when we're giving people movement strategies around it. But you always question, you know, do people actually need to be lifting backboards off the floor or off the ground? Or are there ways, even if you show up at an emergency scene where you don't necessarily have to do that, or you can use tools or other strategies? So this is an example where you still want to be blending you know, good ergonomic principles into our training to see if we can avoid this type of inherently risky lift altogether. So effectively, you know, this is, we can show positive training transfer um, quite easily when the tasks, you know, quote unquote, look like what their, what their uh, practice, you know, if the practice environment represents the real world environment, well, we can do a pretty good job. But of course, a lot of the things that, you know, we are, interested in, there's going to be a lot of scenarios where we can't predict um, that's going to be impossible to reenact every single scenario on Earth. Um, so what could we do in those types of cases? Um, so I, I only have a little bit to report so far on some of the work that we've been doing, but we started now to move into fire hall. So on the left is my uh, one of my couple of my PhD students where we're going in teaching firefighters um, and training them using looking at how different parts of their equipment is affecting their ability to control spine motion so do i have you know stiff work boots and then how does this s the breathing apparatus and teaching them different ways to adapt their foot positioning to you know offload their back when they're using their equipment just kind of helping making them aware of this on the right side is just some really preliminary videos we've been collecting trying to think, and this is obviously very contrived, but this was just kind of getting them, uh, firefighters better at observing opportunities and observing one another. So this is actually like kinesiology theory about, you know, by watching and coaching, you learn, and it's kind of this reinforcing and reci re uh, reciprocating cycle. And so we've, this is only preliminary. This is two months later, we would probably have some data, but um, we don't yet. So we've kind of moved into these situations as well, and hopefully we'll have more to report um, in the not too distant future. The most complete work though, so far is uh, by my co-presenter here. So his team, you know, down at uh, Kite Research Institute, they have these incredible labs, you know, these uh, simulated home environments. And he's been, and his team have been building, you know, these wearables, really low cost, um, you know, very non-invasive type tools to give workers biofeedback, you know, a little, little buzz on their skin or maybe an auditory signal, depending on what people prefer. And he's playing with all, and his team is working on all these different types because all these things can affect, you know, what works and what doesn't. And uh, another thing that I thought was was really good about the work he's doing is it's kind of pragmatic in the sense that he's blending all of this stuff. So his it's really technology assistive, but he's blending education, teaching, coaching, and training. So there are training components and education components all used here. And when you get into these real world type environments that are highly represented, um, their initial work here is really promising. So I know I'm running a bit short on time, so I'll just kind of hit up the main points, but. With a control, so people without any training here, we can see fairly stable. And again, this is uh, just for reference, there's 100% of maximum spine flexion. So again, we want to kind of be, you know, as a benchmark, at least getting a little closer to the 70 or under 70, ideally. The red lines here are the intervention groups that went through this training, you know, many different tasks. So they have their baseline. Um, they did two days of training. So you can see within this day, we can, you know, get a pretty quick drop using this biofeedback technique. So little buzzes on the skin or and or auditory signals. Then we have them come in a different day. We can see we lost a little bit of that training effect or they lost it right away, but quickly kind of back to that level again. And that's pretty close to the threshold with some pretty difficult tasks. Like these are real world um, type of environments. And uh, you can get a, a pretty big drop, like 15 to 20% almost of uh, their maximum flexion. But what the reason I really wanted to highlight this um, is because look at the retention here. So at two weeks, they were brought back in. And we can see after a couple of good days of training, we actually you know, see a fairly sustained response. And even more remarkably and more promising at this point is even with two months, you know, we see a little bit of loss here. 
um, which, you know, kind of gets back to the point that Tilak was mentioning, you know, practice stuff like this is not probably going to stick if we do it once in our life. And again, if we think about other motor skills, what other motor skill, maybe besides riding a bike, so I've already given myself an out here, but there are other motor skills that are, aren't likely to, you know, be lost or degrade without, you know, deliberate practice and good coaching to retain those skills. And that requires progressive type training over time. Um, so again, that would be kind of a Cadillac type of approach. Now, almost finally here, um, Tilak had mentioned this in the beginning about the valuation. So we definitely see this in the research where it's really important, um, you know, we all, you know, I think we can all agree, you know, we're all trying to get these outcomes and the impacts, right? We want to reduce injury and improve health, minimize accidents and so on and so forth. And we want to do that, you know, in a cost effective manner, both, you know, for individuals themselves and also organizationally. So performance metrics, we all get that. But part of the problem is a lot of the evaluation only focuses on that. And I think that we have to respect that training, you know, and changing movement behavior is not a simple process. Um, health behavior in general, and especially movement behavior, this is not something that's going to change in a weekend course. So when we're building these type of programs, we have to be building evaluation in all the way through. And in particular, we want to be thinking and verifying that the people are actually learning and changing their behavior. You know, um, so this is one evaluation model. This is very, very common in training evaluation. There are others, but I think it just, you know, I picked this one because it's kind of simple conceptually in the time that we have. But one thing we see is that, you know, if workers don't buy in or if many stakeholders don't buy into what training could be, you're really in a bad position. You know, we have to make sure that the training is relevant to people. How do we do that? We co-create it with them. Okay, we don't come in as experts, quote unquote, and tell people how to do their jobs. We learn from them and try to find, you know, the ways that and really learn about why they do things um, and have them create their own training. And we kind of facilitate that process the best that we can integrate research into it. Then we want to make sure, are they learning something? Like, are they actually able to, you know, build the competencies and skills and sometimes knowledge if that's really, you know, a, a critical point in your scenario. But even that's not enough. You know, we have to, even if they're able to do this in a practice environment, what we have to verify at some point is do they actually change their work practices? And that's the part I think that a lot of people, it's very logical and it's not easy to do. But, you know, back to the point before, you know, if we don't even know that the training is doing what it's intended to do, it's no wonder we don't get, you know, the outcomes that we get. Um, when you do this well, there, the evidence is actually a lot more promising than all of those research syntheses show when you kind of dig into this. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's really this is this should be established in the assessment. And then I think also giving a reasonable amount of time changing health status. You know, someone, people who have symptoms and signs and the musculoskeletal health, you know, we have to be intellectually honest about, you know, the complexity of that problem. So, uh, you know, training really should be something that we're thinking about doing, you know, kind of ongoing on an ongoing basis so we can progress and learn and keep evolving. So from a take home message, uh, we do recommend training. So despite the fact what the meta analyses say, our interpretation, Tilak said it, is, you know, poor quality training doesn't work. Um, but there is evidence that high quality training of the types that we're talking about here is a lot more positive um, and promising in the research. And I think, you know, this is relatively self-explanatory at this point. I think we've hit, you know, what may look different than some of the scenarios that you've talked about. So really, you know, this artificial distinction between teaching techniques and doing ergonomic interventions in my view, they're not different. Um, people who learn to read their environment and learn to adapt and have situational and body awareness, they're able to adapt their environment. They're doing ergonomics by changing, you know, the way they do their work. They're all one and the same thing. Those are, to me, is a false dichotomy. Um, so with that said, that's uh, full speed. I hope not too far over, but uh, there are some open access, um, there are open access uh, resources here. And I think especially um, one of the best things I've read on this whole topic is this report. So you can grab all of these from the websites um, that are listed here. And uh, I think, you know, may change kind of how you look at this. I know it certainly did for me. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Tyson and Tillich. Just an excellent presentation, concrete examples and overview of what the literature and what practice has to tell us. I, um, I'm just wondering, and I'll start the, the Q&A while we're encouraging participants to type some questions into the chat box. Are either of you aware of any discussions or position papers that have been presented to the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities about these findings for application into curriculum? So before people come on to the job where the employer is tasked to provide high quality training, ongoing training, incorporate changing the environment, are you aware of anything that's being done at the front end, even before that, with some of these findings? Um, like, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I mean, these these the two reports are very new. The 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 report that we went through with the 77 papers is came out last year. The applied ergonomics paper that synthesizes a lot of this stuff is very new. So I'm not aware of anyone that's done that and taking it any further than that yet. Yeah, I would concur with that. I think we've done a little bit of work with firefighters kind of looking kind of quote unquote upstream. So looking at trainees, but I, it's not formalized to my knowledge. It's a good question. Yeah, and I think it's a really important consideration because of the untraining we hear about with um, in particular from from my expertise related to nurses and personal support workers. So they're trained educated in a certain way, and then they come into the workforce and they ostensibly have to be untrained. Not all, but many. Um, so it's something in terms of future considerations could be something that we might be able to look at in terms of a symposium or um, just translating this uh, with the different ministries. So, given that, we have a question uh, and a comment. Great presentation. And any thoughts on how culture and scheduling influences the ability to put good training into practice? So, either one of you or both of you might want to respond to this. Uh, I can take this first, Tilak. Uh, absolutely. I think you're hitting the nail on the head. Um, what the literature says on these types of interventions, you know what, I'm kind of generalizing a little bit, not just manual handling, but any type of workplace intervention. Uh, culture is key. And, you know, how do you change that? Well, there's, you know, a lot of discussion and debate about how that is. I think a lot of it is trying to get leadership and decision makers and champions and trying to find those people because you will find them. Sometimes those people uh, don't necessarily have as much influence, but they can, in, you know, influence the influencers, so to speak. Um, I'm speaking very vaguely here because this is exactly the point that I'm trying to hit, is that if you recognize that, that's something that has to be addressed. You know, like, and it, it doesn't have to be that you're going to be the change management consultant coming in. But if, that, if I know my initial conditions are there's this general pessimism around training, people aren't interested in this, they don't buy in, I'm going to do what I can in that environment and it's probably not going to go with the Cadillac. I'm going to spend, this is exactly what we've done with firefighters. We don't even talk about this. We embed it into their health and wellness cult, um, programs. So we just inject and bleed this into everything, you know, using health promotion models as opposed to, you know, ergonomics type things because it doesn't engage a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, as important as it is. So I, I'm being a bit ambiguous, but the culture is key. Anything I've read about that, if you have, you know, a non-conducive environment, it's a very difficult kind of road to go down. So I think a lot of it is just your first intervention is trying to address that. <clears throat> Uh, I'll just add, I, I completely agree with Tyson. Like, I mean, I think it comes down to leadership in an organization on like if, if they are truly taking care of their employees, I mean, they, you know, that has to be there. If, if leadership isn't in the mindset that they are actually caring for their employees, then I, I think you have a, a really steep uphill battle um, in that organization to try to get right. training. Could I hit one more thing? I apologize. I know there's lots of questions, but I think that's a great point. And the way you said it, Tilak, reminded me of something. It's not only if there is that, but it's got to be the it's 
it's perception as well. So the work that we're doing with firefighters now, a lot of it is to try to compare perceptions across different levels of the organization. Because what you'll see sometimes is, you know, you may have a leadership group that thinks they're doing everything right, but then that's not what the people, you know, on the ground see. And sometimes it's just a lack of communication. Um, sometimes it's real. But I think identifying that, you know, sometimes that can be a huge leverage point because people are on the same page. They just don't necessarily have a shared understanding. Good Thank point. you both for that. And, and I'm just going to go to a couple of other questions. There are some comments being made. Um, certainly, we know we are aware that PSWs are very tightly scheduled and often agencies aren't funded to provide good quality training. And I know that we will be addressing some of that in a few ways uh, in one of our webinars in November, November 9th, uh, if you want to join us, Linda. And we have a question. Are you aware of any link between your recommendations of how training should be developed and implemented and the recommendations put forward in general, such as in the Ontario Health and Safety Training Addresses in CSA 1101? Uh, Tila, do you want to take that one? I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I, neither am I. I was, I, I'm not too familiar with, with what the standard would be on this. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think, I think you're right that this is, I think you're right that there, we need to do a better job of spelling this out in standards in a way that um, makes it easier for occupational health groups to, you know, the, or, or the, the, in a given organization for the people responsible for occupational health and safety for them to 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 be able to do this stuff um and i think i think it is there is a need for it i'm not sure of any link yet that's there okay um thank you for that has there been any literature that supports the effectiveness of different tr training delivery strategies so video feedback auditory feedback that improves the learning outcomes on body aware awareness that you're aware of. Uh, so I can take this to like at least the first thought. Uh, yes, there is evidence. Well, it, the, the question is good. And if you're using the term effectiveness uh, technically, then there's a, not a lot of research. And by that, I mean that effectiveness, you know, do we actually change, you know, injury reporting or costs or some kind of proxy thereof? That research is not, there's a little bit on that, but that's not something we know a lot about. So what we do know is that this training can be, eff it, it can have efficacy, meaning that it can work, right? We can actually change people's movement behavior. Uh, there's a fair bit of research on that, but that doesn't always link to actual outcomes. Now, I can sound like an apologist here and say, well, you know, this isn't, Good thing, but it gets back if you actually read the reports or if we can kind of hammer that point home. Um, you know, if you when you do that well and you you verify this and make sure that the train because in a laboratory environment or you know in some kind of controlled study, it's hard to know if people are actually changing their behaviors. When you can verify that, the research is actually stronger on this. There is evidence that you reduce, you know. The, the cost or severity or all those types of things. But the problem is, is that those things never get included or seldom get included. And when they're included, they're devalued in these research syntheses because they don't fit the cookie, cut, cookie cutter evaluation models. So I'm saying all of that because it's important that we, you know, we have to look at every situation on its own. And this is kind of the inconvenient truth, but this the tailoring is so important. So just because I can teach people to, you know, control their body position in a contrived task, there's no reason to think that will transfer. I was shocked that we saw the, the strength of findings we saw with our exercise approach. <laughs> I think I think that's a good segue, um, Tyson, into the next question, and that is, how do you identify people who have the qualities to be effective trainers? Oh, that's such a good question because we're doing this. I do a lot of work in sport context as well, and this is something we're trying to figure out. Um, so I, I teach a lot of knowledge translation, and I think that um, part of it is people being willing and able to kind of guide by the side. So we don't need to put the pressure on the trainers to know everything. Really, you know, embrace and extract the tacit knowledge from the workers. They know their work better than we ever could. So 
you know, I think someone who has the humility uh, to be able and to be able to, you know, really move people, achieve buy-in, and use kind of techniques, almost like motivational interviewing techniques, to really get people to um, open up and 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 develop the training with you, right? Like we don't need to be the ones building the training. We would need to be the ones facilitating it. So I think, I don't know what characteristic that would be, but I think that would be something that I would think is at the top of my list. People who are very collaborative and kind of sit in the background. And when you can, when the conditions are right, bleed the research in. That's something that we've learned the hard way. You know, we used to come in guns a blazing and slamming meta-analyses at people and all those things. Those things don't affect change. Um, people aren't impressed with the papers that you read. So I think a lot of it is really kind of getting them to create their own program and then you doing your best to contextualize and adapt the research the best you can in that scenario. Thank you so much for that. We we have probably two minutes left and I just wanted to comment that it is so important to embrace the knowledge of the workers. They've learned the hard way, most of them, from what works and what doesn't work. So learning from our mistakes helps a lot to improve how do we do things differently and better. Our last question that we have time for is um, a comment and a question. We're challenged with resources and safe patient handling trainers. We have safe patient handling modules and skills demo videos for nursing staff. We are piloting a safe patient handling skills self-competency checklist where nurses self-evaluate and then meet with other team meter team members or nurse clinical educators to practice and review techniques. What are your thoughts of this based on your research experience? I can take this one if you want, Tyson. Um, yeah, the, it, it seems, I mean, it sounds like you're doing a lot despite being challenged with resources. I mean, this sounds like a really well thought out comprehensive plan. Um, and I, what I, you know, I think I like the ongoing nature of it where you, you know, practice and review, you know, that, that to me says that it, it feels like you're definitely on the right track. I mean, that's, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have a lot of time, but, but, you know, maybe I'll type my email address into the chat and there's, it looks like there's a lot of other questions. I'd be happy to, to chat further with people after, uh, after the webinar. Thank you so much. And I think one of the things that we can do is uh, I've taken note of the questions that we haven't been able to address. And we will certainly do our best to address these questions at one of our upcoming webinars. So um, in the interest of time and to respect our presenters time and all of you, our participants, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I think we've just got, got started on this conversation. We have some great foundational knowledge from these first two webinars, and we look forward to continuing this discussion. So please watch our events page and join us for our upcoming training webinars. Thank you so much and have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Well done, Tyson and Tilak. Okay, uh, Tilak, are you calling me in here?